everyone, and welcome to SUNUP. I'm Lyndall Stout. We begin today with the topic of the weather on our minds and how it affects the way nutrients are able to move through the soil. SUNUP's Curtis Hare talks with Dr. Brian Arnell to get us up to speed. Well, sometimes you have expectations in your wheat field, but the weather can play a really important factor. And Brian, you have an example right here about that. Yeah, the Magruder plots give us some great opportunity to kind of look at things. And so I've been watching these plots for the last couple of weeks, just observing something that I thought was quite interesting. So I'm standing right in front of the manure plot. So this gets beef feedlot manure uh, every four years. If you were to look at the, the where we put fertilizer nitrogen on, it's really green, really big. And so comparing those plots with the manure, manure plot, Knowing the history on this, I would say that we're in year four, because usually the release on this is we get a good amount in year one, we get some of the most nitrogen in year two, year three, we start drawing down. By year four, we really see the deficiency. And so <clears throat> looking at the wheat right now, I'd say we're in year four. When in reality, the manure was applied in 2019, worked in, and so we've only had one crop taken off, which was a 45 bushel crop. And so by all rights, this wheat, should look very much like the fertilized tweet where we have commercial fertilizer. So that's telling me a story on the nitrogen cycle. When we add something like manure, it's an organic source, meaning it's not all chemically available and the biology has to work it down into a available source plant available, the ammonium and the nitrate sources. And that takes time because you have different levels of organics that have to break down. We look at this and, and there's either one or two things have happened here. We've either had leaching, which we've had a lot of rainfall, or we have not had mineralization, meaning the breakdown of organic to mineral to the plant available. And I think we're looking at a combination of the two because we have been wet, but we've also been cool. So I really think we kind of slowed down that organic matter mineralization and are not seeing the typical release pattern that we see in March and early April when we really start that organic cycle up and roaring. We have without question nitrogen deficient wheat. The other aspect that we're seeing and we have shallow rooted crop. We don't have a really big deep rooting structure. A lot of that comes from our rainfall events that we've had all fall and spring we've consistently maintained kind of a a good surface soil moisture and it makes the plants I, i'm a soil scientist so i want to say it makes the plants lazy the crop physiologists would get mad at me but the plants don't really explore the roots so now we have shallow roots we have a lack of nitrogen because the rainfall would push the available nitrogen down we're not mineralizing the organic form and so we have this deficiency when by all rights we would expect nutrients. So, you know, going forward like into, you know, year two or year three, do you, you, you say it's a delay. Is, do you expect that maybe it can catch back up or is that something that you're gonna have to continue to manage, you know, and add, you know, uh, more uh, enriched strips or stuff like that? If this was in a, a production field and I came in in early March seeing this response like this, I would have fertilized to try to bring it back up, try to compensate. The hopes are that we haven't lost it because we haven't tested to see have we lost it or if we mineralized. The hopes are, we mineralize it at some point and it'll be available for year three and or year four. So maybe year four is better than our normal year fours in this cycle. Uh, you know, Brian, a lot of our viewers know that you are actually a professor here at Oklahoma State University with the Plant and Soil Sciences Department. And you actually have a new scholarship program that uh, that's gonna be taking place here pretty soon. Yeah, so we're really excited about it. It's a joint venture with the Plant and Soil Sciences Department, Entomology Department, and NEO a and the junior college up in Miami. And so we were able to put in, between Dr. Hoback and myself, put in for two different uh, NIFA grants, which is a federal funded grant through USDA, uh, for the involvement of Native American students in STEM process, a STEM project. And so it's really great. We're looking for nine students to start this coming fall. Uh, applications are out and what it'll be is the students go through NEO a and for two years. Uh, they're going to do summer internships. They're going to get to work in the brand new greenhouses that NEO has. And then they're going to transition to OSU. And two years at OSU, they'll be able to be take part in research projects and plant soil sciences and entomology. 
and they're going to graduate in four years with three degrees. They'll have associates of science from NEO, a plant and soil sciences from OSU, and an entomology degree uh, from OSU. So three degrees in four years, that's going to set them on a career path for over 25 career path options. This is like an awesome opportunity, but there is a deadline. There is a deadline. We have priority deadline for the application on May 1st. Uh, we want to be able to share the announcement with the students when they graduate high school. So priority deadline is May 1st. We will extend that if we need to after that point. Thanks, Brian. Dr. Brian Arnell, Soil Nutrient Specialist here at Oklahoma State University. And if you'd like some more information on the scholarship program Brian mentioned, go to sunup.okstate.edu. Hi, Wesley, and welcome to another edition of the Mesonet Weather Report. April should be one of the wetter months for Oklahoma, but this year it is not holding true to form. Two to three weeks have passed since most areas of the state received a quarter inch of rain at least by midweek. With seeds in the ground for many crops, hopefully rains will begin soon to help with germination. One farming operation that has benefited with this short-term lack of rain is hay production. Many rye and alfalfa fields have been cut and baled recently and wheat hay will not be far behind. Normally it is very difficult to get high quality hay put up in the spring due to poor drying conditions. That has not been the case though for the last couple of weeks. Temperatures on many days have been running 10 degrees or more above average as this map from Tuesday shows. Winds have been high and relative humidity levels pretty low for this time of year as well. This combination map shows winds and humidity for Wednesday afternoon. Winds were sweeping from the northwest at a sustained 20 to 25 miles per hour while humidity levels allowed for good drying to occur. Hopefully better rain chances next week will help farmers other than hay producers. Now here's Gary with a look at the drought conditions starting to creep back into the state. Thanks Wes and good morning everyone. Well Wes was definitely correct. We do have drought starting to spread once again in parts of Oklahoma. Let's get straight to that new drought monitor map and take a look. Well our concern really lies within the southeastern half of the state. We now have drought spreading once again from southwest Oklahoma up into central Oklahoma. We now have a little dollop of uh, severe drought that's a little bit darker tan color up into uh, central Oklahoma. Uh, that yellow color is a sign of areas in this case possibly going into drought without more precipitation. Taking a look at the rainfall statistics since spring began on March 1st, we do see that area across southwestern into south central and southeast Oklahoma generally between two, two to three inches of rainfall, but in some cases less than an inch of rainfall. Those are the areas that are in real danger of seeing that drought really explode and start to spread. The departure from normal rainfall map from the Mesnet for that same time frame, again, we see deficits across basically the southeastern half of the state, about one to two inches below normal, but in some cases as much as three inches below normal. And then we have surpluses across the northwestern half of the state Generally, although there are a few cases where we have a little bit below normal uh, precipitation totals since spring began on March 1st. We may catch a little bit of a break with the temperature, at least as far as drought goes, not necessarily as the impact on vegetation, um, but we do see for next week uh, increased odds of below normal precipitation, especially across the northwestern uh, quarter of the state. Um, so we could definitely see areas uh, impacted by a freeze once again next week. So we might see a cool week next week. Hopefully we also see some wetter weather to keep that drought at bay. That's it for this time. We'll see you next time on the Mesonet Weather Report. Well, it's that time in the show. We're talking grain markets with our extension grain marketing specialist, Kim Anderson. So Kim, what's going on? Well, if you look at uh, the grains, uh, wheat prices continue to go down. Corn prices probably moving sideways. Soybeans, eh, just a slight uptrend there. Uh, you look at new crop wheat prices, $5.50. That's a dollar lower than they were about six weeks ago. You got corn uh, forward contract price for harvest delivery at four seventy. dollars That's just level about the same as it was in uh, late uh, March, early April. And then you got soybeans at $12. That's a only about six cents above what it was a couple weeks ago. So 
Sideways movement for the two majors, corn and soybeans, and down for the wheat. So why is it down for the wheat? Well, if you look at what's going on in the wheat, I think the market's uh, looking at wheat condition. Uh, the condition uh, for all U.S. winter wheat is 53% uh, good to excellent. But if you look uh, fair to excellent, that's midpoint up, that's 82%. Uh, you can compare that to fair to excellent for all the winter wheat to 84 percent last year if you look at that good to excellent uh, it's 53 now it was 46 it's 62 percent last year so good conditions on that if you look at oklahoma 93 percent of our wheat is fair to excellent compared to 88 percent in november and 70 percent of our wheat is good to excellent compared to 52 percent last november so, I mean, there's some good news in there, you know, with the prices, though, it was kind of like, eh, to, oh, not so good. But is there any other good news going on? Well, if you look at uh, what's going on, uh, uh, you've got tight corn and uh, soybean prices. Uh, you've got uh, the, the, to get a good crop out, uh, we've got to have timely rain. So we've got wheat out there. And it's my experience, I need bushels to sell. The one thing I don't want is a relatively good wheat price. And $5.50 is still a relatively good price but have 550 or $6 wheat and not have any wheat to sell. So I think it's good that our crop's looking well and hopefully we can just get those timely rains to get it in the bin and have it to sell. Yeah, so hopefully we do get those timely rains because you know we're about a month and a half out from when combines are gonna be rolling out in the field. So what, what do you expect for harvest price? Well, I think the best price to predict is the forward contract prices right now. You've got $5.50 for wheat. I put a, a range of about plus or minus 75 cents around that. If you look at the average June price, last year is $4.26. The average July was $4.21. The average August was $4.20. Now, when you got out to September, it's back up to $5.50, and it was almost $6 in January. I think that's the best bet for wheat prices. So last week, we had Josh Lofton on, and he was talking about summer crops and kind of what he expected for planted acres. Um, he expected some sorghum. Uh, you know, maybe corn if the, the weather's right. So what do, what do you think uh, summer crop producers should be planting in regards to price? Well, it's gonna, it depends on what they feel comfortable with. You look at those forward contract prices, remember corn's $4.70, sorghum's five sixty-five. dollars oh, Boy, that's really a good sorghum price relative to corn prices. However, you gotta look at your equipment and your, your managerial ability and see which one of those you can, you can produce. Also, soybeans are $12. Soybeans of all of these has probably got the tightest supplies with sorghum also relatively tight. Corn prices are moderately tight, but if anything's gonna hold the price, it'd be, it would be soybeans. They're all good. So it's what you feel most comfortable with producing. And it's also the weather. And the weather. You gotta look at what, what's going on with the weather. You know, right now the, the uh, Weather Bureau is producing, is predicting above average temperature and below average precipitation for the next 90 days. And that concerns me on one, getting our wheat out and two, getting these summer crops in. So I just hopefully get some rain. Well, you got it. All right, thanks, Kim. Kim Anderson, grain marketing specialist here at Oklahoma State University. So you've probably heard of the term carbon sequestration. Carbon sequestration is just the capture of atmospheric carbon dioxide um, in different plants, water bodies, and in the soil. Plants have the ability to sequester carbon through photosynthesis. So they're using carbon to do photosynthesis and then they're emitting oxygen. Of the different plant types, trees can really sequester the greatest quantity of carbon um, they do this because they're holding carbon in their trunks, they use carbon to, to grow their branches, of course their whole canopy with all their leaves all have carbon in them. And so because those plants 
plant parts are all above ground, that carbon is susceptible to different things like wildfire, disease, insect infestation, drought, all of those things can release carbon back into the atmosphere, especially wildfire. So some people think, well, maybe we can just sequester more carbon by planting more trees. Let's plant trees everywhere. Let's plant them in our grasslands and in our prairies. But that's really not a viable option. One of the reasons that that's not an option is that grasslands also store carbon. So grasslands store carbon in a little different way. Most of the carbon that they're storing is either in their roots or it's in the soil that surrounds their roots. And so this makes it a much more stable place for carbon to be stored. So when grasslands and prairies do burn, the carbon that's stored below ground is less likely to be lost back up into the atmosphere. So both of these plant types are really important for carbon storage for different reasons. But with the increase in wildfire frequency, maintaining our grasslands as grasslands is really, really important for the services that they're providing in addition to their ability to sequester carbon. So if you'd like more information about managing grasslands and wildfire, visit the SUNUP website. Well, it's mid-April, the wheat's coming up, and this is about the time we're starting to look at insects. So Tom, what's the insect pressure look like so far in Oklahoma? We're starting to see the presence of uh, bird chariot aphids, and they typically come on this time of the year. Um, they're not in such high numbers everywhere that I, I'm that concerned about it, but it's always good for producers to, to watch for them because they can build up rapidly once they start getting warmer temperatures. And, uh, and then I have got some samples in like last week of uh, some heads that had already emerged and they were loaded with English grain aphids, which is kind of unusual for Oklahoma. They're usually uh, in, in other places, but this might be a year where they're doing well. They typically get uh, parasitized quite a bit, so we don't ever see them really build up in the heads, but, but the heads that I got samples of, they, they were loaded with them, so. So in regards to, you know, scouting fields for, for both of those aphids, you know, right now, not a lot of heads are starting to come up quite yet, but for the other type of aphids, what's the, you know, kind of scouting method that producers should look at? Well, for English grain aphid, you'd just be looking at heads. I'd take random heads. Um, uh, the only threshold I've been able to find was out of Kentucky. We don't really have a threshold here, but in Kentucky, they say if, they're, if you find heads averaging about 25 English grain aphids per head, um, that uh, they suggest treating. And like I said, we don't have a threshold here because we just don't encounter them that often, but that might be a guide to go by. If, if I was to rub my, um, my hand over uh, wheat like that and it got sticky, you got too many aphids and you need to do something about it for sure. And uh, we actually have some thresholds that uh, are based upon the cost of control and how many aphids you have. But, but uh, a lot of times they build up so quickly that that's what people, they'll say, man, I start, I start having wheat that was sticky. And it's like, well, that's the honeydew that they're producing. There's a lot of aphids in your field if that's sticky like that. So as we go, you know, forward, um, and the wheat starts to you know progress and the heads start to come up that's when producers are starting to be concerned with with army worms what uh, do you have any news on the army worm front nothing right now um we we'll see them we'll see them start building up now but they really um they're usually a problem by the uh, after the the wheat's headed up and the heads have emerged and they'll start feeding on the uh, the awns and in the head it, um, itself and uh we have a threshold of about four to five per linear foot. If you see that many, that's probably a good idea to treat for them. But, uh, and, and we'll typically find them more in, in wheat that's, like the farmer's done a really good job with fertilizer, the, the wheat's really healthy and doing well. That's the, the kind of wheat that they prefer. Um, and they also prefer if the wheat gets laid down at all from a wind, um, they'll, you'll a lot of times find a lot of army worms in areas like that too, so. All right, thanks Tom. Tom Royer, Extension Entomologist here with Oklahoma State University. And if you'd like some information on controlling aphids and army worms in your field, go to sunup.okstate.edu.
Good morning, Oklahoma. Welcome to Cow Calf Corner. Today we're going to discuss EPDs and modern genetic tools we could use when selecting for maternal performance. If we are selecting bulls to use as a rotational sire, meaning that we're going to select out of the daughters he sires to become herd replacements for us as cows, there's a certain amount of things we need to keep in mind. We're going to live with the effects of that bull in our herd for years to come if a cow stays in production for eight or ten years that he sires. So typically we want reproductively efficient cows in beef production, which means a cow that manages to wean off a calf every 365 days. Now since it takes a cow about 283 days to be pregnant, that leaves her about 82 days after calving, during which time she has to simultaneously nurse a calf while getting ready to rebreed and have a fertile heat so that she can accomplish that within a 12 month interval. As we think about entire cow herds, we know that bigger cows tend to put more growth potential into a set of calves, and we know that higher milking cows tend to put more nutrition or have more nutrition available for the calf that they're raising. And so both those things contribute to higher weaning weights in a calf crop. Each of those also comes with a cost because bigger cows that give more milk are also the harder cows to get rebred whenever forages are limited. So literally as we talk about selection for a cow herd, it is a balancing act. It is not typically the biggest or smallest cows. It isn't typically the heaviest milking or lowest milking cows, but literally we are always trying to select for those things that give us a balance of mature cow weight and growth potential she puts in calves, her milk and mothering ability or the nutrition she provides for calves relative to the production environment that we need our cows to be reproductively efficient and productive in that ultimately leads us to the most profit potential. So, what are the EPDs we can look at? Basically, there are four that we see reported in most sire summaries. First one is what we call heifer pregnancy. This is an EPD that gets reported in percentage units where a higher number indicates a greater likelihood that a heifer is going to get bred in her first breeding season as a long yearling and be on schedule to calve as a two-year-old. Second one we discuss is a calving ease maternal. We refer to this one relative to a couple weeks ago that gets reported in percentage units where a higher number indicates that a bull's daughters are more likely to calve unassisted when having that first calf. Last two we discuss are a milk EPD where it is actually indicative of a sire's daughter's ability to give more milk, have more mothering ability, or provide more nutrition for a calf that's going to bump up weaning weights. The fourth EPD to consider is one for mature weight. Mature weight is expressed in pounds, where it indicates how big a, do a bull's daughter should mature or what mature size they should have as we look at that sire's EPD in comparison to another. There are some other maternal EPDs that can be found in one sire summary or another. I encourage cattlemen to look at those sire summaries for the breeds of particular interest to them to potentially see those other EPDs and definitions of them. Thanks for joining us this week. Finally today, perspective on the bottom line with an update on rental rates for crop and pasture lands. Well, uh, you know, the land rental markets continue to be an important topic uh, in the state. And that's prim primarily due to the fact that about 40% of the uh, uh, farmland is actually rented, is leased out. And so to address some of those informational needs, we conducted a leasing survey last fall with the assistance of NAS down in Oklahoma City. And uh, we collected that data and compiled it and then released uh, those results in two extension uh, publications recently updated. Crop rentals have been pretty stable, you know, despite the fact that we've had a lot of volatility in those commodity markets over the last uh, several growing seasons. I think that's been mitigated by the fact that, you know, we've had some pretty good uh, 
uh, crop uh, growing seasons and crop production. So, you know, really going forward, I, I think the big question is whether we can sustain these current price levels in the uh, grain markets. And if we can, I think that will lend a lot of support to those crop rentals going forward. We noticed the, uh, some uh, stability also in the uh, native grass pastures and rangeland around the state. Uh, now on the improved forages uh, and those uh, pasture rentals, we did uh, observe some uh, decline, several dollars per acre, uh, pescue grass and uh, Bermuda grass. And I think that's pretty uh, reminiscent of uh, some tightness in those operating profits uh, in the cow-calf sector. And if we can rebound from the, you know, the lows in the cattle markets that we experienced last year, if we can do that, and the hope is that we can, uh, I think that will lend a lot of support to those pasture rentals going forward. And uh, we've updated those publications based on that uh, leasing survey and those results. And I think it's a good place to start for those landlord and tenants to uh, get their discussions and negotiations started you know, across the table. Hopefully by the end of the day, they can end up with something that's satisfactory and agreeable to both parties. That'll do it for us this week. A reminder, you can find us anytime on our website, sunup.okstate.edu, and also follow us on YouTube and social media. I'm Lyndall Stout. Have a great week, everyone, and remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at sunup.